All right. Well, thanks so much to everybody for uh, coming to this American Conservative webinar. Uh, we are pleased to host uh, Dr. Bruce Gilley, who has an essay in our recent issue, the May-June issue of the magazine, uh, the print magazine. Uh, and we are excited to have an opportunity to speak with him about that uh, article, as well as uh, other issues relating to it and his research uh, pertaining to that. Uh, before we get started, I do want to take a, just a moment and uh, invite everyone, if you are not already a member, to become a member of the American Conservative. Uh, you can do that by going to www.theamericanconservative.com uh, and clicking on member. Uh, you get full access to our website as well as our print magazine six times a year. Uh, along with uh, some other benefits as well. And so we'd really appreciate it if you would consider becoming a, a member of our community. Uh, with that, I will introduce our panelists and turn it over to them. So Dr. Bruce Gilley is a professor of political science at Portland State University, where his research centers on democracy, legitimacy, climate change, and global politics. He's particularly a specialist on the comparative politics of China and Asia. He's the author of several books, including The Right to Rule, How States Win and Lose Legitimacy, and his articles have appeared in Foreign Affairs, Comparative Political Studies, and a number of other academic journals. He holds a PhD from Princeton University and an MPhil from uh, University of Oxford and a BA from the University of Toronto. So welcome, Dr. Gilly. Uh, and Jude, interviewing Dr. Gilly will be Jude Rousseau, who is the managing editor of the American Conservative, as well as a contributing editor to the New York Sun. With that, I will turn it over to Jude. And, uh, thank you again, Bruce, for, for joining us. Um, I think that uh, some of our listeners are going to be familiar with the book, some aren't. Uh, but so we'll, we'll get into the, the guts of the thing in a moment. But um, just to sort of pull back the curtain for a moment, what inspired you to come to a piece of historiography that is uh, almost 30 years old at this point? Very influential. People still talk about it all the time, but you know, by some people's lights, a little bit old news at this point. In part because it's the 25th anniversary of this book, uh, King Leopold's Ghost, published by Adam Huxchild in uh, 1998. And um, so there was that. There was also the fact that Ben Affleck has a movie coming out based on it, which uh, uh, scared the living daylights out of me. Um, and I think the more direct prompt was, you know, uh, I had a friend, we have friends who had a child in high school and his son, uh, their son was assigned King Leopold's ghost in their world history class to read. And the father wrote to me and he said, is there anything I can give my son that would provide another view on the independent state of the Congo, King Leopold's Congo? And I looked around and the answer was no. Um, there were some things written in French, but, but really not kind of essay length things. And Having heard about this book as being cited again and again as the sort of definitive argument about why the West is evil <laughs> and why the West's engagement with the rest is always based on profit and violence and plunder and exploitation, I decided the world desperately needed to go back to this book and see to what extent it was a fair, balanced account of the episode. And that was the motivation. Of doing this, and um, and I hope that um, what it will really do is provide an alternative view for those hapless high school and college students who are given this by their professors and teachers as kind of you know biblical authority on this episode. Yes, and it's always been a little strange to me that Hoke Shield um, has gotten himself such a. a such a unassailable place in the uh, high school and college canon, given that he's uh, a journalist and not a historian, um, which I think is an important distinction to make. Um, but uh, let's just, as I said, I think that some of our listeners will be familiar with the book, some won't. 
Um, let's just uh, start with, you know, a quick uh, pressy of what Pokes Shield's argument is and what agenda we think he's pushing in this piece of work. So King Leopold's ghost is, uh, in theory, a history of the uh, Etat Independent du Congo, sometimes called the Congo Free State, but it'd be better translated as the Independent State of the Congo, which was essentially a private colony uh, given to the Belgian King Leopold II uh, at the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 on kind of sorting out claims in Africa. Um, and from 1885 uh, until 1908, when this private estate was handed over to the Belgian government, um, it operated uh, as a sort of um, free trade area where uh, King Leopold II created uh, the basics of a government system, the basics of a police force, um, achieved some monumental things in terms of infrastructure, in particular the first railroad to get above the series of rapids at the end of the Congo River, opening up the country to trade. And uh, and what Hotchfield does with his book is essentially zero in on a very limited, um, very episodic uh, and highly unintended aspect, which was when they discovered rubber and they discovered that rubber could be exported profitably, the question was how to go about doing it. And there were essentially three companies doing rubber production. This is in about 15% of the country, right? So this has nothing to do with 85% of the region. And it's got about the same proportion of the population. So 80% of the population, this doesn't affect, right? And in doing that, which was basically the way to fiscally save the Congo Free State, uh, these companies were empowered. And in many cases, because they had essentially native sentries and native uh native guards uh, overseeing the rubber production. There were skirmishes, there were atrocities on both sides. Maybe 5,000 people died in these, uh, maybe 10 as a high estimate, that's a terrible number, but nonetheless, uh, in a country of maybe eight to 10 million, uh, fairly small. And Hotschild takes this and blows it up into a great forgotten Holocaust of the late 19th, early 20th century and directly compares it to the Nazis and every single rubber plantation becomes a mini Auschwitz. And this is for Hochschild a kind of great example of evil Western people attacking hapless black people. And this is his summary of the, of the Congo independent state, which is in my view, not only complete distortion of what the Congo free state or the Congo independent state was doing, which was mainly fighting the Arab slave trade and stopping endemic in inter-African tribal warfare and dealing with the public health problems of the area. But it's also a vast distortion of the actual rubber producing areas and, and the degree of violence and, and death that happened there, which is way overstated in his case, most of which is native on native, has nothing to do with the Congo Free State itself, and was also extremely varied. A lot of the rubber production was very successful and not violent and didn't involve any difficulties. The rubber came easily. so. He's engaged in what a story would call a massive example of selection bias. He finds a little problem in a little part during a few years of this place and blows it up into the equivalent of the Holocaust. This is so distortionary and so shameful uh, as someone claiming to be an objective writer. Um, and all the more so that this is then sold to our children and our college students as a great example of the evils of the West that it really needed to be corrected. And that's what I do in my essay. And quite uh, compellingly, I think, um, you know, I, I don't have a head for numbers, uh, but I do have a head for archival research. And something that I found really staggering when I was reading your, your, your piece is uh, how Hoke's Shield just gets away with, um, you know, taking letters from administrators who are saying, do not do these things, and cutting off the part that says, do not, and running with it, um, which is something that another, um, we'll say, uh, dissenting voice about colonial history found, um, Nigel Bigar. Uh, whose latest I, I also reviewed for the American conservative. Um, he finds again and again 
that even real academics are just hugely um, irresponsible with archival sources. They take you know, an instruction not to do a thing and then just take all of the part that is not and leave the description of things you should not be doing. Um, so that I think is um, fairly straightforward, as I said, even for people like me who don't have heads for numbers. But the uh, striking thing is that, you know, he takes this episode of trouble for the rule in which five to 10,000 died. And I think he ends up claiming, you know, the numbers are a little bit astronomical, but I believe northward of half a million dead from the rubber tray. 10, 10, 10 million, 10 million. Right, oh, right, okay. Um, how does he get from here to there? Um, he gets from here to there by making up numbers and misquoting numbers quoted by others who were in turn misquoting earlier numbers. Um, and he doesn't really care, right? Because how did he get from here to there? Because he read something that Mark Twain wrote at the turn of the century saying 10 million people dead in the Congo. Uh, and so, so Hotchild was fixated on this idea of 10 million dead, of a forgotten or a lost Holocaust. Uh, he came at the project from the beginning trying to show that somehow the Belgians had murdered, you know, Leopold II had murdered 10 million Black people and nobody cared because they were just Black people. And this showed white supremacy and racism. Absolutely ridiculous, right? So the demographic numbers suggest that at the beginning of the Congo Free State, well, the French demographers who actually looked at this first suggested there were three to five million people in this area. Now, that was three to five million people who were present and accounted for, according to the French. Now, of course, everybody knew that there must have been other population centers that had not been visited or seen or documented. So the, so everything above three to five million is inference, right? So we have various projects in the 80s and 90s, and the inference is basically probably eight to 10 million at the time of the beginning of the free state, probably 10 to 11 at the end of the free state. The most pessimistic account suggests a slight decline of 10 and a half million to 10 million uh, that's by GP, J.P. Sanderson. Um, that's his like worst estimate, right? But he thinks it's actually probably the most accurate one is 10.5 to 10. In other words, basically no population change. The reason there's no population change is because even though the Congo independent state is allowing Black lives to live more, it's in, in dealing with endemic slavery, endemic tribal warfare, it's dealing with public health crises. But the slavers from the Arab East are causing more deaths and more destruction than the EIC can keep up with. So overall, it, it becomes a wash. After the Belgians colonize it, the mortality rate declines very steeply and fertility goes through the roof and the population of the Congo um, explodes. But the foundations for the Belgian Congo were laid by Leopold. And he is a great savior of black lives in the Congo. That's the fact. Hotschild doesn't want anything to do with it. So he goes back and uses the essentially fabricated and ignorant statistics and tries to claim 10 million killed by Leopold. It's ridiculous. Nobody ever has asserted that. And the fact that he got away with it is the more astounding thing, uh, Jude. And I, 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 I don't think it would be better in the hands of an academic historian. The academic historians are some ways worse because, because Hotschild is just a good old lefty advocate, right? I mean, down with the Vietnam War, down with capitalism, down with Amazon, Okay, fine. So we know where he's coming from, but he's still sort of someone who cares about documentation of facts and truths and, and anecdotes and whatnot, even if they're selected to fit the narrative. But the academic historians would come at this with a vast theoretical infrastructure of the evils of colonialism, and it wouldn't be treated, it hasn't been treated any better in the hands of the academic historians. But the notion of a Holocaust or a genocide or even a massive population decline caused by the EIC is absolute bunk. The um, point you mentioned about uh, the Belgian efforts against the slave trade are interesting. And because of space constraints, um, there, you, you don't address it at great length in your essay. Um, could you just sort of describe what those um, anti-slavery efforts were and whether they were successful or not? And, you know, the uh, there tends to be this idea that you know um, 
the brutality required to end the Arab slave trade uh, obviated the, the end of the Arab slave trade. And uh, this is part of the anti-colonial black legend um, against the British especially, but also others. And at least in the British case, which is what I'm more familiar with, this is not actually borne out by facts. So if you could talk a little bit about the Belgian case, that would be helpful and interesting for me at least. Well, the, the Belgians uh, never had slaves and never engaged in the slave trade. So uh, sneering at this as kind of European hypocrisy is a bit rich <laughs> for the Belgians, even if we were to engage in this kind of ahistorical idea that, you know, if you once did wrong, ever doing right again is just, uh, you know, hypocritical because you once did wrong. Well, then how can we ever have a notion of human progress? It's ridiculous. Uh, the Belgians did undertake this task, or Leopold did, um, because nobody else wanted to go into the Congo Basin. Why? Because your life expectancy was uh, about three years as a European uh, in this area, um, mainly because of malaria, sleeping sickness, endemic diseases. Uh, tribal warfare was endemic, and the Arab slave trade, and the Arab slave traders were absolutely uh, terrible, gang, violent, you know, this was, this was a society of violence is what this was. Nobody wanted to colonize it. Nobody tried. Nobody could. Leopold undertook this task because nobody else would. Um, and his deal was simple. Was, I'll get rid of the Arab slave traders and open it up to trade. You give me the kind of the ability to control this and bring glory to the Belgian people. Great. Well, that's when bringing glory was still kind of something that nations tried to do. Um, it gets turned into this quest for profits, right? Well, if it was a quest for profits, Leopold would never have gone in there because it was an extremely profit draining enterprise until a brief period of a rubber boom when the rubber rubber revenues came in. But this collapsed very quickly as well, um, 1902, 1903. So really what Leopold was doing most of the time, most of the efforts, and and if you read the documents, it's all about either intertribal warfare and um, stopping cannibalism and human sacrifice or dealing with the endemic Arab slave trade, which dominated you know, pretty much the entire eastern half of the country. And um, and because Leopold is doing this, because he's sending his troops into so many of these areas prone to Arab slave raids, Hotschild takes this as all, well, the anti-slaving excuse was just a cover. Really what he wanted to do is, is organize it for rubber ex expropriation and ivory expropriation, right? It wasn't anything to do with the slave trade. Well, it's a ridiculous claim, A, because there were lots of places that they could have just settled and left to the Arab slave traders, but they had undertaken to, to fight the slave trade. And secondly, because there's no possible way except for the for a freakish rubber boom uh, that saved that saved the place kind of mirabil dictu. Um, this never would have been a profitable undertaking. It wasn't intended to be a profitable undertaking. It was intended to basically give the Belgians something they could be proud of because they had essentially been locked out of the entire uh, overseas uh, colonialism enterprise. And that um, transformation of, of uh, an item of glory into an item of shame, I think is interesting. Um, I want to talk about that in the con, you know, I want to contextualize Hooke's Shield a little bit in this larger project of turning Western European and American history into something to be ashamed of and as a particular kind of um, better on certain political expressions. Uh, you know, we were talking before this call, we, we met at a conference about weaponized shame. And so um, do you think that uh, hoax shield is, um, do you think he, he this is a leading question, but uh, is his axe to grind deliberately part of a larger um, cultural revolutionary project to uh, stop certain cultural expressions? Or is he just out there, he has his piece to say, he's going to shout his truth? Yeah, no, his whole oeuvre is essentially the shame of the West by Adam Hochschild. It, this, this, is his, this is his worldview. Um, if you look at his latest article in the New York Review of Books, praising the 1619 Project, 
and disparaging the Hillsdale College curriculum for American history, right? His main gripe with the Hillsdale College curriculum is there's not enough shame in it, you know? And he thinks that shame should be at the center of American history. Um, and he then goes on to praise the 1619 Project, saying it shows how shameful we are. And, right, his main point is, it's still shameful today. America is the most shameful nation in the world. Amazon warehouses are just as shameful as slave plantations in the American South. That's that's the 1619 Project. And Hochschild says that's right. And he calls that comparison masterful. You know, oops, <laughs> that's not quite the right word to use. You need to do some microaggression training at Berkeley there, uh, Mr. Hochschild. But um, but he believes that capitalism in the West are evil and should be, and we should be ashamed of them. So what hope is there that an obscure and, and far removed from us episode in African history more than a hundred years ago could ever get a fair treatment in the hands of someone who makes his whole project, his whole intellectual project to disparage and attack and undermine the West and the capitalism that has made it the most desirable place to live, including the Berkeley citrus plantation where he sits and sneers at the country that's given him so much. Um, what, what hope is there of an objective history? It's it's beyond, uh, you know, you don't even have to read the book to know this cannot possibly be an objective account of the Congo independent state. Um, yet it's acquired such a, a hallowed place in the pantheon of liberal popular history. Um, how did that happen? Uh, you, you, you know, I, when we were preparing for this, you sent the New York Times review for the, uh, for the piece, um, but that wasn't isolated. I mean, this is being taught to high schoolers. How, how did that come to be? Yeah, the New York Times reviewed this not once, but twice. I mean, they just couldn't get enough of it. So uh, Michiko, reviewed it in the paper and then a journalist from Britain reviewed it in the in the book review um, in September 98 when it was issued. Um, Michiko in Michiko's usual moral posturing stance calls it genocide with spin control and calls the history in Hostile's hands one of history's most heinous acts of mass killing. Um, and then the New York Review of Books, a New York Times book review review calls it a frenzy of killing and profiteering, right? So this is a, this, this is another reason for taking this up now. Let's not think that this is something new, right? This, this need to engage in what I call guilt porn um, with respect to Western history and the, the rabid demand for this among liberals and leftists to tell us more about how guilty we are, and um, be as pornographic as you can with the, the 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 lascivious details and the lurid facts of how how guilty we are. So this goes way back. This goes back to the to the nineties, maybe even to the eighties. And so I think it 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 simply feeds into the demands of white liberal re readers to feel guilty because you know, this is the Shelby Steele argument, because guilt gives you moral transcendence and moral transcendence reestablishes your moral superiority or, over others because being guilty. I actually asked Marcus Yabili, who is the Congolese lawyer, I quote at the beginning of the piece, calling Hotshield's book, the greatest fabrication in world history. I said, um, I said, Do I, does anyone in the Congo read this book? He said, nobody in the Congo read this, reads this book or takes it seriously. No, none of the media uh, says anything positive about Hotshield's book. He says, the only Congolese who like this book are the Congolese living in West Western liberal societies who need to establish their status. And to do that, they use this as their kind of victimization currency, right? Look how much of a victim I am. So please hand out grants, special access to resources, special status in your society, um, all that, right? So it's basically, yeah, it's a book for the white liberal West. It's got nothing to do with the Congolese people. Indeed, it's an attack on the Congolese people because the Congolese people fought alongside King Leopold to bring decency and education and public health and settled secure societies to their, to their area. The Congolese don't need to be told that their history is a complete 
legacy of an evil white man in Belgium who never set foot in the place, right? It's demeaning, it's degrading, it robs them of agency, it robs them of their own history. It's just like what Hotschild does trying to say that, that Kurtz in Heart of Darkness was based on a Belgian official. He wasn't based on a Belgian official. He was a transposed African warlord or slave lord transposed onto a white man for literary effect. But all of that source material of Kurtz is just dozens of accounts of African warlords. Those are the people that the Congolese people were fighting against, rightly so. Right. And um, it's still ended up because of the efforts of uh, Michiko and her ilk as um, high school canon. Um, I just want to, before I ask the next question, Next question, much as I'd like to monopolize the conversation, uh, we do have a Q&A section in the Zoom chat, which will be, I think, I think is already open. Um, so if you have questions for Professor Gilly, please put them in there. Um, but uh, before um, I start drawing from that so that people have a chance to put things in there, uh, a somewhat forward-looking question, what hope uh, do you see, if any, of undoing this kind of slur, slander, um, and the sort of immense amount of oppressive cultural baggage that comes with it? I mean, as you, as we've said a couple of times, we're, we're almost you know thirty years on at this point. It's in the high schools. This is probably all that most people who think about the Congo at all think about the Congo. Um, how only now are we having, you know, an accessible essay length rebuttal in English. What do we do against that? What can be done? It, it's a big mountain, Jude, you're right. Uh, and no one essay or one person is going to move it. Um, I, I think we are at last uh, breaking through the silence um, the silence of anti-colonial dogmas and anti-Western anti, anti dogmas about the experiences of the European encounter with the rest of the world. Um, but it's a very, very censorious wall that we're dealing with. All of my colleagues uh, working in this area know that, um, not just on the European encounter with the, with the rest, but the European encounter with Native Americans here. Um, I see Dr. Weiss is on the call. Um, so, uh, it's going to take a while, but I would say this. First of all, the academics and teachers who have bought into this are not going to change their minds. So I'm not frankly interested in changing their minds. Uh, what I am interested in is giving alternative accounts to young people who have yet to make up their minds or have yet to be subjected to this indoctrination. And I get emails from them all the time, uh, college students who said, you know, um, I found this essay and wow, my professor never told me this uh, or someone in the Belgium in Belgium saying, you know, all we hear from the Royal the Central Museum for Africa is this evil, but you know, there's this other side. So I think it's it's not so much about changing the, the, the establishment, but just letting the establishment age out and be replaced by people who have developed at least an understanding that on most large historical issues, there's more than one viewpoint. Um, a second thing I'd say is, um, you know, I would love to have published this in an academic journal, but academic journals will not accept this kind of thing, right? So people have said, oh, there's no footnotes in your essay. So two things. I have a book coming out in the fall called The Case for Colonialism, which will bring together uh, expanded versions of multiple essays I've published on this topic, including this one, and it will be fully footnoted. So, so don't worry, you will get all my sources <laughs> in the book, which will be out in November. Um, and at a certain point, right, you will get uh, the possibility for these sorts of essays to show up in, in academic journals again. Maybe academic departments will start hiring people, but it's, it's a long-term project. And it's mainly, I think, going to be a generational transformation rather than a changing of the minds of those who have been responsible for this orthodoxy. An encouraging note. So we have some questions here in the box. Uh, and I will uh, sort of go in order of, of rigor so far. Um, an anonymous user asks, uh, where are the European academic historians on this subject? 
which I think is an interesting question since they don't always have the same strictures on speech that we do. Yeah, so I mean, the the Belgian academic debate on the EIC is quite interesting because in some ways, uh, Hochschild's book brought this woke division to the Belgian academic debates that had not existed before it. Um, and a great example of that is the, um, the Cambridge uh, History of Africa entry on the Congo independent state uh, that came out, I think, in 87, was jointly written by um, a guy called Jules Marshall, Jules Marshall and uh, Daniel Van Grogenhoe. Now, sorry, sorry, John Stengers and Daniel Van Grogenhoe. Now, uh, Van Grogenhoe was Stengers' a student. Um, and Stengers is considered a conservative on this, i.e. he doesn't think Leopold was evil. Uh, he rejects the idea that there was any intention to bring about mass violence, that the mass violence was anything except minimal and limited and quickly controlled. Um, Van Grogenhoe later wrote a book called um, Blood on the Vines, which was very critical of the EIC. So basically, you have a professor and his student who themselves end up having very different views on this. Fine. But they jointly author the chapter, the, the authoritative English language chapter on this episode, which just showed that prior to Hochschild, there was just a normal academic debate in the Belgian academic world. And that's that's changed, right? Now you're either woke and you realize this was the equivalent of the Nazis, or you're an apologist, you're a Holocaust denier, you're a far right agitator, right? Just all these slurs thrown. So unfortunately. Um, with with a couple of exceptions, uh, the Belgian and certainly I would say the more general European academic historians have just gone sharply in the direction of monoculture and a lack of debate. And therefore, the quality of the scholarship has gone down because now it's essentially torturing the archives to spit up the lurid details taken out of context uh, and without any understanding of counterfactuals and other factors going into play in these situations that's given rise to all this terrible history that's being written now. Uh, the most uh, egregious example recently on the British Empire is uh, Carolyn Elkin's book, Legacy of Violence, um, which, guess who praised it in the New York Review of Books? Adam Hochschild, um, calling it, um, calling it uh, further evidence of the violence that was endemic to the British Empire, right? Whatever that means. Um, so, uh, so this is something that I think has captured the academic historical enterprise, perhaps even more than the journalistic one. That's why I think, Jude, that, that saying that Hochschild's not an academic is kind of like begs the question of whether being an academic would make it any better, and I don't think it would. Fair enough. Um, the uh, people are typing live, but um, just to take one that is a little bit forward looking uh, from Mr. Evan McGuire, with ongoing Chinese mining and other extractive efforts in the Congo, are we seeing people realize the European approach to developing countries might be a bit better than what the East has to offer? I think it's a little bit of a leading question, but um, I think uh, an evaluated, an evaluative question, you know, how do current ongoing extractive efforts in the area compare to the supposed Holocaust or not? Uh, well, right, right. So basically, you know how this works, right? This is every bad thing that's ever happened in the Congo since the Belgians left is a legacy of colonialism and a legacy of the brutality of the Belgians, right? It's got nothing to do with the Congolese. It's got nothing to do with bad leadership. It's got nothing to do with anti-colonialism and anti-colonial ideology and anti-capitalist ideology and the continuation of the, the resumption of ethnic conflicts that the Belgians had brought under control. Uh, it's all a legacy of colonialism, right? So this is, this is a ridiculous claim. Apparently, this guy, Anthony Bourdain, who did a, one of his like cooking shows in the Congo, has a big monologue to begin it about the evils of the Belgians in the Congo. And um, uh, it's ridiculous at many levels. Um, first of all, because uh, 
the EIC and certainly the Belgian Congo, 1908 to 1960, you know, rattling towards independence in the late 50s, um, was the only time the Congo has ever been a semi-successful place. Um, I mean, people don't realize that under the Belgians in the 40s and 50s, I mean, people would take family vacations in the Congo. Uh, they would rent a car and drive the breadth and length of the country with their families um, and have picnics on the side of the road. I mean, this is just unthinkable now, right? So to say that somehow when the place collapsed after the Belgians left, this was a legacy of colonialism, um, is, to, is to completely 180 degrees reverse the truth. The truth is that it was the disappearance of the colonial rule that had started to bring into place some foundations of decency and, and governance and stability in this place that caused the problems. And um, the Chinese being able to access a country with a very weak governance system and a, a very weak uh, regulatory system is just a, um, I wouldn't say it's a cause of the Congo's problems. I think it's an effect of the Congo's problems, right? And um, and we just have to like get over this idea that somehow the, the Congo is uh, about to have a renaissance now that it's independent of the Belgians, right? It's been a, it's been a horrific, uh, 60 years, um, including, you know, a world war in the 1990s that most people don't know about. Um, and the reason most people know about it is because it had nothing to do with white people. So there's no Adam Oxchild book on it. But um, but that's the suffering. And the suffering is a result of the hasty decolonization of this country, not because of colonial legacies. I think I think that the, the haste of decolonization is something that uh, is significantly underplayed as a cause of the problems in all of these places. Um, we have a question that I'm going to abbreviate a little bit because, as written, it's somewhat lengthy. Um, one, uh, Mr. Townsend Cock, uh, what are your sources for claims regarding public health achievements, Marianne Leon? the author of the main study on sleeping sickness in the Congo, writes that sleeping sickness did in fact spread under Belgian rule. And then Townsend continues paraphrasing, saying that Leopold funded English epidemiologists to whitewash the Belgian regime and paint a false picture of Belgian successes in the health field. Um, if you want to pass on the, the uh, and say it's going to be in the footnotes in the book, I understand. But it is it is in the footnote, but I'll tell you what the short answer to it is, um, because I dealt with the same question in my book on German colonialism, which is the spread of sleeping sickness occurred when people began to move and trade because places were opening up to trade, because transportation links were developing, because um, populations and labor was becoming migratory, not just forced labor, but all kinds of labor. Uh, people were being porters, people were traveling on ships and working in different places. And sleeping sickness is an incredibly infectious disease. So basically uh, they didn't understand that. They didn't even understand you know, where it came from until shortly before World War I, which is by the way, you know, when the, the independent state of the Congo ends. So to say that it spread when the Belgians were there is to identify a correlation, but not a cause, i.e. the Belgians would have, would whether the Belgians were there or not, sleeping sickness was going to spread throughout Africa very rapidly because simply of the opening. It spread everywhere. It spread in the British areas too. It spread in the, in the, in the well-governed German areas, especially in East Africa. It, it spread everywhere because it was an infectious disease brought about unintentionally through the opening of this continent to trade and transportation and migration. Now, the only hope in that situation is not to send everybody back to live in a mud hut and be isolated, because I guarantee you the life outcomes will be much worse. The solution to that is to, is to identify the carrier, to develop vaccinations, and to roll them out as quickly as possible. Now, in the context of 19th century Africa, doing so was very difficult. And yes, there were a lot of misfires. There were misfires in the French attempts to control sleeping sickness. In the German attempts, they tried prophylactic drugs. Some of the early chemotherapies were, were not effective. But don't forget, this is a, this is a disease with an 80% mortality rate. So if you get it, you're pretty much a goner. And so the 
fact that experiments and early uh, testing of, of prophylactic or vaccinations were not that successful and had 30 or 40 percent mortality rates, you're still better off to get it, right? So this is this, it's this bizarre transposition of kind of modern public health norms onto a situation that is totally unrecognizable. And thank God these modern scholars of public health had nothing to do with trying to control sleeping sickness back then because they would have been running around looking for consent forms or gender neutral bathrooms or something while people were dying dying off like flies. I mean, there were very serious and earnest and, and heroic Europeans engaged in tropical medicine in Africa. And it's a very proud record. Thank you. Um, Alad Vaida, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, asks, uh, you said that Congolese generally don't buy into the Western narrative regarding the history presented in Hawk Shield's book. Is this generally true regarding how Africans regard the history of colonialism in other countries as well? Uh, is it generally true that they don't buy into the West's woke narrative of the evils yeah. of colonialism? I think it's generally true that views about colonialism are more mixed and complex among the colonized than they are among white liberals in the West, without doubt. I don't think even the white liberals themselves would, would deny that. Um, you know, what's frustrating to liberal professors when they go to Africa and interview people of course, the memories are, are faded, but try and ask them, you know, what did your grandparents think? And they, they get so frustrated. They, oh, my grandfather thought the Germans were the best, you know, and uh, my grandfather always got out his French Legion of Honor medal, you know, every Bastille day and marched up and down the village square um, singing, you know, the Bastille. Uh, so, I mean, they get so frustrated by this. And why? Because the Africans knew what the choices were. They understood the situation of being colonized or not being colonized. Most of them ended up moving towards the colonial centers because they knew very well that life was better there and life was better under colonialism. Now, there were all kinds of petty slights. Yes, of course. There was all kinds of unfairnesses. Yes, of course. There were often governance failures, uh, police running amok. Of course, this is a human system. Tell me a human system that doesn't have this. But but invariably, I'll just say that the, the views in the colonies are much more mixed than the kind of monoculture, anti-colonial fanaticism you get in the West. Which I think should be, <clears throat> I think should be regarded as encouraging in some way, um, because it suggests there's a reservoir of common sense somewhere out there. Uh, an anonymous uh, attendee asks, has Hook's Shield said or written anything either pro or in favor of or against the atrocities that have happened after the Belgian withdrawal or specifically those that occurred during the withdrawal, for example, the Simba rebellion? Uh, simple answer is I don't know. I have seen him give a talk on um, the history of the Congo from the EIC, the Congo Independent State, through to the present. Um, and I don't know where this talk was, but I remember a Congolese woman standing up at the talk and saying, um, why is it that you think you have the right to tell us our history? Um, and, um, and, I, and I don't think she was um, so much uh, debating, you know, particular things of his history. But I think it was a more of a sense that, um, you know, why is it that we Congolese don't produce history that uh, that we want to read? Um, and, you know, much of it, of course, has to do with the fact that it's a, basically a failed state and most Congolese get the heck out of there. And when they do get the heck out of there, if they're academics or journalists, and this is kind of Marcus Ubili's point, they're not going to get any traction in Western societies by trying to defend the Belgian Congo period or the Congo independent state period. Um, so the incentives are all skewed towards them buying into this narrative. So the people who should be producing objective, fair accounts like Marcus Ubili. Marcus Ubili still lives in the Congo. He's a lawyer there. He's produced a four volume account of the Belgian period uh, that's full of praise. But um, but, you know, he's a he's a unicorn. Most of them, when they leave, uh, they either 
uh, produce woke history or they just fall silent. So um, Hawk's Shield never really uh, has had anyone to compete with his book in the English language. And that's, you know, in part a problem that I don't see a remedy for. The the fact that um so I think we lost you there. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I was struggling with the mute button. Uh it does seem a problem that it, it seems that many of our problems are downstream from historians not bothering to learn the languages uh, pertinent to the archives they're supposed to be working on. Um, and I agree, I, I don't really know how to fix that since it's a problem that starts in the high schools. Yeah, um, and you know, uh, Jean Vancina, the, um, the, the Belgian historian who ended up teaching at Wisconsin for most of his life that Hochschild quotes for the 10 million dead figure, um, you know, was a was a very skilled historian. He he spoke several Congolese languages. And, you know, the book that that Hochschild cited, you know, Vancina later said it, it's I was mistaken. It's wrong because I went back to the sources and the understanding and it's it's not correct. So at least you know, there was a generation of historians who who could really spoke the language, they lived in the place, they understood. The other great book I will highly recommend is David Van Rebrook's uh, uh, Congo, the Epic History, uh, Epic, uh, the Epic History of the Congo by David Van, Van Rebrook. Um, it is a fabulous book, um, eminently fair. Um, critical of the Belgians when they need to be criticized, praising them when they needed to be praised. Um, he views the, the Leopold era as essentially kind of irrelevant, um, a small and kind of ultimately bankrupted enterprise that gave way to what it should have been all along, which was a formal Belgian colony. Um, but he is totally unsparing of his criticism of the post-colonial leadership, and he cites many Congolese tribal chiefs and regional leaders at the time of the 50s saying to the Belgians, please, for the love of God, do not make us independent. Because these metropolitan intellectuals who have suddenly flown back from Brussels and Paris and Berlin, claiming to be the George Washingtons of the Congo, are lunatics. Um, first and foremost among them, Patrice Lumumba, who, thank God, the Belgians assassinated, who would have caused the country to break up. But, um, you know, uh, this is basically the, the problems of, of Congolese history, which is that uh, there aren't a sufficient number of English language books generally accessible beyond Van Rebrook's that just give us a good, honest account of this country's history. Yes. Um, the, uh, I think this may be our final question since we're, running up against time. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, when's the debate with Affleck? Which I will reframe as, when's the book coming out? What's the title? What should we be looking for? <laughs> um, well, um, so uh, this essay will be expanded and referenced um, for a book called The Case for Colonialism, which will come out in November. Um, I, I don't know if it's if I will write a book on this topic, um, you know, because in some ways I feel that um, we've had books like this come out um, and they sort of get attention among those who would keep an open mind, but largely get sort of ignored by those who should be paying attention to them. Um, I would, I would love, however, to have a serious conversation with Ben Affleck and Martin Scorsese about their new movie. The former Belgian uh, Overseas Officers Association wrote a seven-page letter to them back in 2013 uh, when they heard that this project had been revived and provided them with all kinds of resources, offered to serve as consultants, um, you know, people who really know the archives, the history, the memoirs, um, the sources, right, said, we are here to help you research this movie. Please reach out to us. Last I heard, they had not heard back, right? So I can produce a book. I'm not sure it will make any difference to Ben Affleck's new movie. 
a shame. Uh, Sean, uh, is there anything that you'd like us to go over? Any final plug for the magazine you want to give before we uh, let these good people go? Yeah, well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Gilly and Jude. That was a great conversation. Really appreciate you coming on to talk about this uh, uh, interesting, somewhat obscure, but very important topic. Uh, and so thanks for everyone who hung out with us for this. Thanks for everybody who submitted questions. Sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but uh, please, but do look for the book and go to the website, www.theamericanconservative.com. The article is out from behind the paywall for a limited time. Um, but if you become a member, you don't have to worry about that. You can uh, get it at any time, as well as the print magazine. So. Um, Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah.